Amen. Come on right now. Let's go. Amen. Let's go. Come on. Everybody that went to camp. Even if you were just there part of the week, let's go. Has everybody took a bath since we got back? I hope so. Because it was getting bad there them last couple of days, I'm telling you. I mean, they run, and y'all know it rained every day. There was about 70 of us. We had a lot of them right back yonder or not in, were with us today. There was about 70 from our church. And, uh, boy, I'm telling you when, you, when you run, play, and sweat, and then that sweat dries and you sweat again, and then that sweat dries and you sweat again, and then it rains, and then ain't nothing that smells worse than somebody's drunk and then tries to take after and drink put cologne on to cover up liquor. That's worse. Sweat and liquor and cologne will just about knock a dog down. But uh, uh, that's what Mom always said. It'd knock a dog down. But uh, uh, that that sweat gets rough. But we had a great time at camp. And uh, I don't know what we're going to sing. We could sing Father Abraham, but we ain't got time. It's a long song, and. Uh, we could uh, we could have some testimonies, but uh, where where you at, Johnny? Raise your hand, Johnny. See that young man right there? Lord got a hold of him at camp. Raise it up there so they can see it real high. Hey, Amen. And he texted me the other day. He said he'd read the whole book of Proverbs since camp. Isn't that a blessing? What a blessing! Isn't that something? Some of y'all been in church all your life and ain't never read the whole book of Proverbs. And he'd been reading. What you been reading now, John? Sports Illustrated. <laughs> what? Oh, hey, John. I told him to read John after that, so he's reading that. Amen. That's good. Listen, if you get in that book, the old saying is, that book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from that book. Amen. That's a truth. If you'll keep reading your Bible regularly, you'll quit your sinning. Or you'll quit your Bible reading and keep on sinning. One of the two. They ain't room enough for a Bible and sin in the same heart. It, it, one of them's got to go. <laughs> Bible that you know, this heart ain't big enough for both of us. One of them's got to leave town. Uh, but anyway, uh, we had a great time at camp. We had nearly twenty saved. We had uh, uh, there was five other churches I think went with us, and we just had a wonderful time. It rained now. It rained about every day, but that was better than it being one hundred and four like it was the week before that. And I want to thank again. I want to thank again all of you who who gave money to help some of these kids. A lot of the kids come on the bus. How many of y'all came on the bus this morning? Raise your hand if you rode the bus this morning. Amen. And about half of them that's up here. So uh, our bus ministry is working, and the bus ministry is the greatest tool in America for the local church. It really is. It's the greatest. It's the greatest. And so um, I tell you what I want them to do. Sit down. Everybody find you a seat. Everybody find you a seat. That means you, her. This girl here cost us extra. We had to have extra counselor just for her. Um, I, but we're going to let them lead you in a song. So they're going to be the leaders, and y'all follow them. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. I know it was a hand of the Lord. And buddy, with the hand of the Lord touched us that Thursday night. If you missed that thing, it was tremendous. And lives were changed. Lives were changed. And people got saved. So we're going to sing it. Now you've got to clap your hands and you have to go through the days of the week with us and stand up on the day you got saved. If you don't remember the day you got saved, stand up on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, as long as you know you got saved. Okay, we got, we're clear on this. Everybody know what to do? All right, here we go. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, glory. Now y'all got to sing too. Everybody sing. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. No, it was the hand of the Lord. Sing. Y'all ain't 
singing. Some of you ain't clapping. Some of you ain't singing. Let's go. Come on now. Was the hand of the Lord. Everybody ready? standing, they're coming down. Turn around there one more time and be friendly. Be friendly. Shake somebody's hand. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated now. Amen. You can be seated now. All right. Now we're being still. Everybody being still and quiet for a minute. Take your Bible. Open to the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3. The book of Zephaniah, chapter 3. And when you find Zephaniah 3, raise your hand, please. We'll find out who's, who reads the Bible in here. One, keep them up. You got your hand on Zephaniah, raise your hand. We're waiting on the rest of y'all. You're coming in there, that's better. We're waiting on the rest of y'all. Zephaniah, chapter 3. Give you a hint, it's in the Old Testament. Give you a hint, it's near the end of the Old Testament. All right, thank you. You can put them down. friend of mine went up to a little country church up in the mountains. He said, turn to Hezekiah chapter 2. Them people have been in church 100 years and sat there in 15 minutes looking for it. He said, you bunch of hypocrites, there ain't no Hezekiah chapter 2 in the Bible. Uh, and they got mad at him. Can you imagine that? They got mad at him. Why would a person get mad at the preacher for something that they do? If you're doing it, it ain't the preacher's fault. That's like a woman getting mad and smashing her mirror because it shows the wrinkles in her face. <laughs> Don't blame the mirror. Get you some of that Bondo. Uh, you, it's makeup when you're 14, 15. You just want to look pretty. But then as your years go by, you have to have Bondo. And, and ditches, cracks. And, and so don't blame your mirror. Amen. Let's look at Zephaniah chapter th uh, 3. And I want to read some scripture here beginning with verse number 1. Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning with verse number 1. Please, give me your attention. Woe to her. And when he says her here in this scripture, he's talking about Judah. Judah and Jerusalem, Israel, the tribe split up. And he refers to her as, as a woman, like a city is referred to in the female 
gender, like Charlotte. They say Charlotte's a queen city. Uh, many times a city is referred to as a woman in the Bible. So here in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. Notice, she obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. I'm ringing a little bit, Brother Mike. And she drew not near to her God. Verse 3, her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests even have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. Boy, is that true or not? The unjust knows no shame. I have cast off all the nations of their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. I said, surely, wilt thou fear me? Wilt thou receive instruction? So their dwellings should not be cut off. Howsoever I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. I want to preach this morning on the subject, the road to spiritual ruin. If you want to ruin your life, I'm going to tell you how to do it today. If you want to ruin your home, I'm going to tell you how they did it in the Bible and the same thing people are doing today. The road to spiritual ruin. Basically, this nation, or this tribe, and this city did four things to God that ruined their city. I know hundreds of people that have went down this same road and ruined their life. First, it said they obeyed not His voice. Disobedience. Second, it said they received not correction. Disregard. Third, it said they trusted not in the Lord. That's distrust. And four, they drew not near to their God. That's desertion. Let me say them again. Number one, they obeyed not God's voice. That's the first step to spiritual ruin and ruining your life. First step to ruining your life is, well, I know the Bible says this, but I'm going to do that. That's the first step. And the second step is they're saying, disregard. They received not correction. Nobody couldn't tell them nothing. Nobody, the prophets preached. The preachers told them, but they would not listen. That's a sign of the next step of spiritual ruin. The first step, disobeying God. The second step, I don't care what He says. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm tired of living for other people. I'm tired of doing what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do. There's your first step to messing up your life. Amen? I don't care how big and tough and strong you think you are this morning. You need to be in the subjection to that Bible and let God run your life and tell you what to do and what not to do. You're not smarter than God. I'm not, you're not, and nobody you know is. Nobody can outsmart. You can't outsmart God. When Carrie was little, I used to tell her all the time, we'd get down the floor and we'd play, and I'd say, you can fool some of the people some of the time, and all the people every now and then, and some of the people now and then, once in a while you can get them off, but you can't fool God. And I'm going to tell you this morning, people, we can't fool God. And then the third thing is distrust. They trusted not in the Lord. And then the third, fourth thing is desertion. They drew not near to her God. Disobedience. They obeyed not the Lord. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I know that some of you have asked, and, and of course you want me to say something about the uh, tragedy we've had in our country in the last few days and the shooting out there, the mass shooting in that movie theater um, um, Friday, Saturday morning or whatever it was, 12.30 at night in Aurora, Colorado. Strange that it's not too far from Columbine. 
where the same thing basically happened just a, a few years ago. But what happened was the premiere of the new Batman movie. I didn't know. I didn't know the name. I didn't know there was a Batman movie coming out. Uh, it was named something else, Dark Knight, sort of a suspicious, scary sounding name. And they named the movie The Dark Knight, K N I G H T, like a knight in armor. And that movie was to premiere at that theater at 12:30 at night. There were people paid 150 dollars for a seat to get in there that night. And they were there for hours and hours waiting on that 12 o'clock midnight showing. Typical, when a, when a big blockbuster movie comes out, they hype it up, they hype it up, and they try to, to, to get money, to make money off of it. And so this, this situation was a situation as any normal big summer movie would bring. Um, uh, about that time... 20 minutes into the movie, a side door opened, like they have those exit doors in the theater, like that one right there. Have a side. The side door opened, and this guy comes in, 24 years old, James Holmes. He comes in dressed like he's going into combat with a bulletproof vest, gas mask, but he has his hair bright red and his face real white, and he says, I am the Joker. He's the Joker in the in the in the movie. He comes in, he comes in like that, and he's got a gun. And most people that they interviewed thought that it was part of the show. They thought, "Oh, this is cool, man! They're bringing in a real live uh, guy here, like like it's on the movie, and he's got a gun and everything. This is cool." And he shoots one dime up the ceiling. I thought, "Wow, this is cool." And then the sad reality began to set in. That young man, uh, I, we'll, we'll talk about him more in just a minute, but that young man, he took a tear gas bomb, pulled his tear gas and threw it back there. The smoke went up here, threw another one over there, and immediately you couldn't see. You couldn't open your eyes because it was so, uh, let me down just a hair, brother. Uh, uh, that, that tear gas were blinding people, and so people were doing like this. They couldn't see, and then all of a sudden, I mean, bullets it's faster than I can say that. We're just spraying all over that room. Obviously, people begin to realize that it was real. By the time that it was over, 70 people, like that's the last I heard, would have been shot. And 12 dead, the last I heard. I would think there would be one more to match Columbine. And the day or some, I hope not, but it probably will. And they, they, uh, they, they were shot. People were screaming and running everywhere. They said that there were people screaming, running out of that theater with bullets, holes, well, them bullets go right through you. They don't get in you and stick. I mean, they go all the way through your body. Something that powerful. Except the ones who went through the wall and hit the people in the theater, the other one next door. And there were people who got shot in there. It was a horrible scene. It was a terrible thing. And you say, Brother Danny, what's, it's, uh, you, uh, somebody asked me yesterday, was that on bus route, me and Brother Mike? And, and uh, they, were asking, yes, they said, well, they're going to have to start having security at the movies, just like they do at airports, eventually to search everybody, to search people, and to stop this and to stop that. And people scared to go to the movies now, scared to go to school. You have to have, have, have it happen in the school. And they're on there saying, guns are the problem. And, all that. and listen, I'm going to tell you, Eventually, if the Lord don't come, it'll happen in church. You listen? If the Lord don't come, it'll happen in church. None of these doors are locked here this morning. Any demon-possessed person could walk in these doors. But I believe that God kept His hand on churches all these years. But it's coming. It's coming. And you know why? Because our society as a whole has said, I don't care what you say, God. I'm going to do what I want to do. We're going to do what we want to do. And God says, okay, but there's always consequences. All I heard yesterday, that boy's crazy. That boy's crazy. That boy's crazy. That boy was at the top of the top of his class. He was going to be a neuroscientist. You don't get no smarter than that. That proves education don't straighten out the world's problems, don't it? People say, well, if we could just get everybody educated, you'd just have them, have them smarter ways to kill people. Amen! 
I'm telling you this morning, our society has said no to God. And I know there's some of you sitting here this morning saying, I don't want to hear that. Don't bother me with the facts. Just, just let me believe he was a nut. He was not a nut. He was a brilliant young man, but he was led by demons. The Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And when you see stuff like this happen, we are seeing that they are giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You ain't safe nowhere now unless you're right with God and in His will. What bothered me bad was they, got a, they had a priest on Fox News the other night and this priest was going to come on there and offer his advice for the whole country, father or somebody. And he got on there, and you know what that guy said? The newscaster had more spiritual sense than he did. The newscaster said, well, Father, don't you think that this is a sign that society is on a downward spiral? You know, like society's going down. And he said, uh, not necessarily. And he, he gave a five-minute speech, and here's basically what he said. Oh, it's a wonderful time for us to show love one to another. And in a time like this, we should all love one to another. He did not mention God. He did not mention the Bible. He did not mention repentance. And he said twice in his little speech that our society was not on a downward spiral. He said this does not mean society is on a downward spiral. You know what he was saying? Please don't think this is a sign of the times. Don't think things are getting worse. Let's just think everything's fine and keep the money coming into us. That's basically what he was saying. But I'm going to tell you that guy was wrong. He, he should. He's a man of God, supposedly. He should have got on there and he said it's a time for us to repent as a nation and turn back to God and get our families in church and get right. It ain't no time to be quitting, people. It ain't no time to be laying down the, uh, uh, the Bible and our sword. It ain't no time. It's a time to get our families in the house of God and get in the altar and weep and pray until God helps us. And I found, hey, some of you sitting right here this morning, it's been so long since you felt the presence of God. You forgot what it feels like. You forgot what it's like to be really right. You just come this morning because it's a Sunday morning ritual. You need to get right. We need to get our hearts right with God in this country. It is on a downward spiral. It is on a downward spiral. When we went to school, people took guns to school and nobody got shot. Guy had him in the back of his pickup truck. He'd have a shotgun. And he's going squirrel hunting when school was out that evening and nobody thought nothing about it. Tell me we ain't on no downward spiral. We are. How sad. It said they obeyed not his voice. And then it said they disregarded. Received not correction. Somebody get on TV and say, well, if we don't get right with God, this ain't the last time stuff like this is going to happen. It, there'd be no telling how many people get saved. But you know what our problem is? Religious leaders get on there and smooth it over like it's no big deal. And everybody's saved and God loves everybody and everything's cool. And, that, and that's what's killing our country this morning. We need to repent. We need to repent. Let me tell you something else. I just preached that sermon on addictions at the youth rally just three months ago, or however long it was. We are now seeing, we are now seeing it get worse and worse. That sermon, by the way, we just got an email from somebody in Australia who got that sermon on addiction and was passing out to the aboriginal Young people over there said they had so much problem with drugs and alcohol and they're making DVDs and sending that to them. I, I guess they understand English. I don't know. But they, they, they're passing that around to them. And they, they sent an email to us and said, you don't know the problems that we're having here. Thank you so much for that DVD. We got letters from uh, somewhere up, in, up, up near Chicago, out, out somewhere out west, way out there in Colorado somewhere, in different places, in different countries, how that God's using them. But let me tell you what's going on. A doctor in Cleveland, Tennessee the other day talked to a preacher. He said, preacher, he said, we have buried 12 of our choice young people in this community in the last few months. Buried them. Teenagers. He said, they're overdosing on drugs by the hundreds. He said, what they're doing now, see, kids don't have to go to the drug dealer now to get you drugs. You don't have to go to a drug dealer now to get you drugs. You go to the doctor to get them. Or you go to somebody who's been to the doctor. 
Now we're in trouble, people. We are in trouble. And all you parents, listen up to me. Listen to me this morning. Hear me. This preacher went there. He said, these are church kids. These are kids that are from well-to-do families. He said, most of them, their parents make lots of money. They have everything they want. But he said, they're overdosing on cough medicine. Robitussin. He said, anything that can buy, drinking more of a cough medicine and it speeds your heart up, your heart races fire, you finally collapse and you die. It wasn't long ago, just the other day, 14 year old boy went to spend a night with another boy. He was about 15. They waited till everybody was gone. They went into their parents' uh, bathroom, got into the medicine cabinet, got the cough drops, a cough medicine out of there took a bunch of Robitussin pills and everything else they could find. Their heart sped up so much. They were in there. They had heard about it. They had heard their friends at school talk about it. All the cool people in California do it. So we're going to get high. And they run. their mama come in the next morning and one of them was laying face down already dead and the other one was in a coma. And these were good kids. These were kids. that. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something. Let, you know what they're doing now? Kids are having parties where they all get together and all of them get the medicine out of their mama's medicine cabinet that she forgot was in there and they all bring them to the party and they're staying up all night putting them in a big old bowl and spinning it around and you reach in there and get whatever you grab, you take and swallow. And it's happening all over this country. Down in Georgia, it's everywhere. They said it, their people are absolutely, it's, it's an epidemic. They said one, one place down in Georgia, they had absolutely buried 23 kids in the last certain amount of time. One of them took 50 pills. 50 pills. 35 million kids now have tried cocaine in this country. 12 million crystal meth. 97 million smoke pot. I heard about a guy, this is off the subject, but I'm going to tell you anyway. This guy went to the hospital. He had some kind of surgery, and he was just an old redneck guy. He didn't understand how your system cheats you. And he got a big bill of tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars. And he went down there, and he didn't just say, well, we'll pay the best we can on it and let the insurance pay what we can. He wanted that thing itemized. And he made them itemized. He said, I want to know what all this is for. And finally, reluctantly, they printed it out for him. He went around and he said, I want to talk to a doctor or somebody. He said, y'all charge me. This is ridiculous. And the doctor never would talk to him, never would talk to him. He called down there and said, you going, a doctor going to talk to me or I'm going to get me a lawyer. And finally, the doctor talked to him. He said, what's this right here? Aspirin, $20. He said they had one thing on there, $50. It was a pack of peanuts. He said, what are y'all trying to do? Why is all this stuff on my bill? And he said, that doctor looked at him and he said, how do you think we pay for all the people that don't have insurance? That's what he said. Now when it's got that bad, brother, and everybody's crooked, the crooks and the doctors and the lawyers and everybody, we are in a downward spiral in this country. Amen. We're in trouble with this medicine business. He said, how do you think we pay for all these people that don't have insurance? And I'm not getting into that debate. I feel sorry for anybody that can't pay. I, I'm not saying we should just let people die. But I'm, there's got to be a better way than that. Lower the prices. That would help. 500,000 deaths a year now because of drugs. Let me tell you how bad this drug problem is. It, we spend, these are new statistics. We spend $131 billion a year treating diabetes. We spend $171 billion a year treating cancer. You got it? $131 on diabetes, $171 on cancer. You know how much drug we spend on drug problems, drug rehab, and drug addictions? $484 billion. Twice more than we spend on cancer. That's how bad it is. That's how bad it is. Teenage boy, just the other day, they said, went to a doctor. They had took him. He had OD'd on cough medicine. He was about 15 or 16 years old. The doctor looked at him and he said, Son, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, You've got two or three minutes to live. Your lungs are collapsed. He was coughing up black stuff and spitting it up. 
And he, that doctor was a Christian. He grabbed that boy's hand. He said, you got two or three minutes to live, buddy. And he said, I'm going to pray with you. Do you know Jesus? And the boy shook his head. And that doctor bowed his head and said, Dear Lord, God, please have mercy on this boy. Call on him, son. Call on him. And I prayed a 45-second prayer. And that boy was dead like that. Just like that. You listening? Don't tell me we're not on a downward spiral. And yet... We trust not the Lord. It said desertion. They drew not near to God. Instead of confessing their sin, just go right on in sin. Instead of doing fine, listen, listen to me, people. If we don't get right with God in this country, we're seeing we ain't seen nothing yet to what's coming. We, oh, shut up, brother Danny. You're painting a bad picture. There is a bad picture. There, there has never been a nation in history that's left God that God didn't judge eventually. There has never been a case in history where God let a nation get by with what our nation's getting away with. There has never been a case in history where the Lord just turned His head and said, Oh, I'll just go on. It don't matter. There will eventually fall the judgment of God on our country. I don't want it. I want us to get right. I want me to get right. I want you to get right. I want us to fill these altars. I want us to get in here and say, Oh God, Lord God, I'm backslid. Lord, help me. That's what I want us to do. But listen, if we keep saying... You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday, not Friday. Uh, one of our church members was eating. And I said, listen, you know, he said, you know what's wrong with us? He said, we got too much. And that's the truth. We've got so much. God's been so good to us. We don't have time for Him no more. Well, we can go to everything in the world, but we can't come to church. We can make the ball game, but we can't make... We can have kids at cheerleading practice five days a week, but we can't even come to church on Wednesday night. We can afford everything else, but don't put our tithes in the offering plate. I'm going to tell you something this morning. God still wants us to put them tithes in that offering plate, and you're not right with God. If you ain't doing it, I wouldn't be in your shoes. I'm telling you, you you, you just a liar. you just a hypocrite. you just claiming to be right. You're supposed to give God... What belongs to him? You say, oh, I'm mad. I am too. I'm mad at the devil. I don't know who you're mad at. But he hates everything I'm saying right now. I know preachers tell me, they say, Brother Danny, we won't have revival. I can't even get nobody to come. You think Wednesday night ain't important, some of y'all. It's what you think. I'm telling you. You're going to change your mind one of these days. You think it's not important to read your Bible every day. No big deal. You'll change your mind one of these days. I'll tell you a little story and I'm through. I've been praying and fasting. And I fasted extra this week for this service this morning. Because I want the Lord to do something for us. Is there somebody... Here, I just heard this story, and they said this is a true story. A missionary was down in, in Africa. And he's working down there with those heathen tribes in Africa, and he said he worked down there with them people where they, you know, there's tribes that worship the Nile River and crocodiles, and they believe that crocodiles, uh, you know, that sounds crazy to us, but they really believe that those crocodiles are 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 divine and and supernatural and the river has life giving power where all the life comes and so it's God and that missionary said he said he would sit down there and watch those women out of that tribe bring their babies and he said those women will bring their babies down there right there their flesh and blood children and throw them in that river and sacrifice them to their God for their God's wrath to turn from them and to appease their God. He said they'd done, it, they'd done it for thousands of years. And he said he was sitting there. He said he was sitting there one day. He said he watched the woman come down that bank. He said she had two little babies. Both of them her babies. He said one baby was a little old scrawny thing. You could tell something was bad wrong with it, like it had disease or something. It was all drawn up and scrawny and, and everything. And she, looked, and she put both them babies down on that river bank. He said the other baby was a picture of health. He said that baby was laughing 
and, and, and healthy looking, just pretty color in its face. And, and, arm, and, and he said, that woman picked up that healthy baby and we we're going to throw it in that river, them crocodile, to sacrifice it to her God to, to make up for her sins. And he said, he come running down that bank and he come running and said, no, stop, don't do that, don't stop. And, and she had done threw it in. And he talked to that woman and he said, I want to ask you one question. He said, why did you throw that perfect, healthy baby? Why didn't you? This one over here, I don't mean this bad, but he said, it don't look like it has long to live anyway. Why didn't you sacrifice that to your God? And she turned to that guy, and here's what she said. If you got a spiritual bone in your body, that'll speak to your heart. She looked at him and she said, I don't know what God you serve, but she said, the God I serve demands and deserves I my best. And I'm not going to give him anything but my best. That's what she said. And here we serve the true God that made heaven and earth and everything there. We don't give him half a time what we're supposed to. We're supposed to give our best. We're supposed to dress our best. We're supposed to act our best. We're supposed to be our best. We're supposed to give our money our best. We're supposed to be faithful in church. Give Him our best, people. Give Him our best. Amen? Sad day when people worshiping crocodiles are more dedicated to their God and we are the God of heaven. That's what Judah did. He said she regarded not the God. Now I know it's summertime. Now I know people get back. I ain't stupid. But I'll tell you one thing. It's a time right now. It ain't no time to be letting up. If you'd push your kids to get in Bible school like you push them on that ball team, your kids might love Jesus as much as they love ball. I'm not saying it's wrong. Have that. Go have fun all you want to. I, I do it myself. But I'll tell you one thing. My kids were taught, look, when it's time for church, it's time for church and it ain't time for nothing else. Hey, Amen. Amen. That's a path. You're on a path to spiritual ruin, people. You know where you're on your path to spiritual ruin? ruin? When you start just letting up a little bit. You let up here. You let up there. You let up here. You let up there. When used to, you wouldn't miss. When used to, you would, would, you'd pray. Used to, you're, and you, you know what you need to do? Yeah, I'm jerking up on you a little bit this morning. That's what I'm doing. I'm jerking up on you a little bit. And you ought to come up here and shake my hand and say, Thank you, preacher. I needed that, and I needed it worse. And I'm going to get in that altar this morning and get my heart right. I don't want to go to spiritual ruin. Let's stand by our head for prayer. I could tell you story after story after story of people who went down the same road some of you are going down. And right now they're in prison or jail or in rehab. Going down the same, I see the same pattern taking place. Some of you sitting right here this morning in a year's time won't even be going to church if you don't get a grip and get right with God. Some's already coming. This altar going to be full this morning.